Around the NFL Podcast is slowly taking over the Baltics. Yeah, we are. Welcome to another edition of the Around the NFL Podcast. My name is Dan Hansis, coming to you from a virtual room filled with some heroes. Mark Sessler, Greg Rosenthal, what is up, boys? Hey, now, Danny. I think they've, I think they've got us confused with... Um, Jack Easterby, who literally probably is creating <laughs> designs to take over territories and countries. I don't know what what is our strategy to uh, usurp the Bal- the Balkans. I don't know if that's if we can we can't even find our way to you know cross town when we go to a Super Bowl week. <laughs> it's true. That's that's when we need our general Kevin Patra. Um, no Chris Wessling today. Um, as everyone knows, Wes is in another fight right now against the Big C and. Uh, you know, before we get going today, it's it's inc- it's incredible for us to be able to see it, but you, the listeners, don't always. I'm sure you could hear it because you could hear it in Wes's voice, the fight that he's putting in on this. Uh, but um, how much of his heart he's putting into doing these shows and doing the work, writing on the website, the Great QB Index, and um, doing the tape study, and still delivering top Wes analysis, and we're so lucky that we've had Wes uh, to this point this season. But today is kind of a reminder um, of the fight that he's up against and how it, it takes so much out of him. And I know all the listeners, obviously, boys, are 110% behind Chris. Um, and we don't want to, you know, put undue focus on on his fight. But at the same time, like when he's not here on today's show, it's more like an appreciation of what he's been able to do uh, while going through this situation all over again. Yeah, I think this last week's been a tough one. If, if people knew, um, and, and Wes has been public about it, the back pain that he's had, what, what he's going through, like waiting for like a four-hour window where he, he's not feeling as much back pain so he can pound out like one of the best like 3,000-word QB index columns like on the internet. It's really, it's kind of amazing um, how he's been pushing through. So uh, I echo all your thoughts, Dan Wilson. Well and I would say that the handoff from Greg to Wes on QB index is sort of a Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers type scenario. I mean, I really, it's two people that couldn't work harder on those pieces, but you're getting West right now. Those are the vibrant hours of his week, and he's putting it into watching Game Pass, and those things have been like so juicy to read. I mean, there's just not, as people have said, not a wasted word. So anything that Wes it. offers. You almost had the analogy, Mark. What? Because it wasn't with, you know, Favre and Rodgers, direct handoff. This is more like the Colts, where it was. Of course, Peyton Manning, then the Curtis Paint, Painter year, and now <laughs> Andrew Luck. I, I didn't want to dig in too deep on the brief interlude between the two uh, giants, so I, you know, I kind of left that off off there. Yeah, but can, you I flamed can. our edit- editing desk, so that, that no. they can handle that on their own. So I would never do anything like that. They do great work as well. Um, so anyway, uh, keep the fight, Wes. We love you. Uh, this is the flagship program. Nick Shook's going to join us in just a little bit. Uh, usually he joins us later in the show, but one of the games he covered happened to have, uh, you know, the biggest injury story of the season. So we're going to get to that. Also, um, I guess we should just knock it out in terms of little league news up top before we get to the first game. The NFL, in the middle of the early games today, uh, dropped a bomb press release. Um, that's not like 1990s slang, like, oh, the release was the bomb no <laughs> it was like a bomb, bomb. yo yeah uh, basically how they've juggled their regular regular season schedule because of coronavirus outbreaks the titans and patriots um of course affected directly by that but nine teams are affected by the schedule um reconfiguration some over a period of weeks through november 22nd new england tennessee denver buffalo kansas city miami L.A. Chargers, New York Jets, and Jacksonville Jaguars. Denver's game at New England originally scheduled for Sunday, then moved to Monday night when the Patriots had more COVID-19 tests. Now will be played next Sunday afternoon. Then that move came after the Patriots had another new positive test for COVID-19 on Sunday morning, according to a report. Uh, So unbelievable. No TNF this week. That was kind of my biggest uh, takeaway from all the shuffling. Uh, Assuming Bill's 
Titans happens on Tuesday, yeah, they were scheduled on Thursday, and so there's no TNF game this week. I mean, it's still technically TNF if you wanted just to go acronym for Tuesday night. That's going to be very weird. There you go. It's not not really ever, you know, some, it's never happened during our show. At Tuesday night, usually, you're in the clear to do other human things, not this time. Didn't we learn, though, um, through last Monday night, Mark, that they're very serious about the property infringement of the different games that are connected to days, you know, the Monday night football snafu of Monday? But, you know, the less said, the better. No, no, you're Just right. I mean, I'll, I'll probably be found in a, in a van by the side of the highway <laughs> at some point for, you know, going down that road. All right, let's get to the game, starting with, uh, to me, the most surprising outcome. It happened at Arrowhead. They have got to go. They're down two scores. Andy Reid knows it. They need seven yards here for a first down. Fourth down and seven. Here's Mahomes back into the pocket. It holds, fires deep down the middle, intercepted. It is picked off by the Raiders. Jeff Heath, 20, 15, 10, 5. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. First down and goal at the two-yard line. Brent Musburger. It's so crazy. It's Brent Musburger every time. <laughs> it's like 300 years old. But you know what? That was a good call. What? Uh, who is doing all the Raiders games now for the past couple of years in, in Vegas, uh, where he is running also an empire of some kind, I believe, Musburger. Anyway, Patrick Mahomes was shut out for most of the second half through that late interception that was really a dagger. Uh, and the Raiders' offense piled up nearly 500 yards of offense on Kansas City in a 40-32 to win over the defending champions, like I said, at Arrowhead. And, boys, this was a perfect day for the Raiders. You had Henry Ruggs, who's a, a big difference maker uh, when he's in the lineup for this team because they desperately need that other guy. Josh Jacobs is a very nice running back. Darren Waller is a playmaking tight end. But you need that guy that that could spread the off spread the defense and make big plays. And that's what Ruggs did with two long catches, including a touchdown and Derek Carr. When you guys fire up the old game pass with this, you will be impressed. Uh, he, you know, a man that's often criticized for conservative play. We talked about on this podcast. I, I told him just the, it's okay to be Derek, Derek, Derek. Uh, and what he did today, the, the guy that gets killed for being a check down machine, Threw two bombs for touchdowns, had played with poise and precision, outplayed mm. Patrick Mahomes. Uh, this one was for the haters uh, of Derek Carr. And if you're the Chiefs, yeah, is it a bad game or a sign of bigger issues? I don't know yet, but uh, it's quite a loss. Well, their offense hasn't been the same this year. And, and they look, they put up a lot of points uh, against the Raiders today. But to have a, a long stretch in the second half where they don't do anything that's out of character almost all their numbers are out of character uh offensively but i think it's a reminder yeah it's like players matter and sometimes we're like well this team is banged up but then we go on and kill them um but you get trent brown back who's an all pro caliber tackle and you get your first round pick rugs back who when he's been on the field this year has absolutely made a big difference and suddenly a very good offense turns maybe into a great offense and and you get some plays and you coach around uh, your defense. What what a win! They've had a brutal schedule to be three and two despite this schedule, uh, and it doesn't really get much easier after the bye. Uh, I think they have the Bucks uh, and then another really tough game that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But it, it, they've done amazing to be three and two at this point of the I season. I mean, if you're if you're a Raiders supporter or if you're Derek Carr. Or if you're everyone that's flamed Derek Carr left and right, including me. I mean, I, I've just never really loved his style of game. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that, like, while the league becomes a deep ball league, he doesn't seem to be part of that party. And today is the kind of win that you just can savor because you knocked out a team that has not just beaten you, but destroyed you um, in the Mahomes era at times. I mean, your defense especially. And you've, you've beaten a arch rival. Um, you've made it a rivalry again, at least for now. It hasn't made been it for a, a division long time. race, maybe. It's a division race, and Derek Carr did it um, in a way that shuts everyone up. So it's a pretty sweet. It's about as sweet a Sunday as you could script for the Las Vegas Raiders. Right, like I said, it was a perfect day for them, and it does show their ceiling. Like when they are humming, which I didn't think they could play at this level, and I'll point specifically at the defense. You know, they finished with over twenty pressures. The, the second most, I believe, that Mahomes has ever faced hmm. in a game. They forced 
as you heard, his first interception of the season that nearly went back for a, a pick six. That came on a throw made from a crumbling pocket. And uh, Kaleche Osemele, who had been a big pickup for Kansas City, he went out of this game uh, with an injury. So they also got dinged up on their offensive line, the Chiefs. But to me, it's a great game, and it's a fascinating game because I think there's big stories on both sides of this, that mm. the Raiders' ceiling might be a little higher than we realized, that Derek Carr might be a little bit more dynamic. I mean, we talk about, and we'll get to the Dalton scale in a little bit, we talk about uh, where he fits in the landscape and how players like him go up and down depending who they're with. Well, if Henry Ruggs is a superstar deep threat, uh, you know, we are going to see Derek Carr start hitting on more of those big plays if everyone stays healthy. So nice job of the Raiders. Chiefs, we'll see. Is this closer to the Chiefs team from a couple uh, years ago where the defense was an issue and they had to score 40 points every week? Because usually that doesn't win the whole damn thing. All right. Let's bring in Nick Shook now. Shooky gets called up to the early portion of the show. Um, We wish it was under better circumstances. Nick, how are you, by the way? I'm fantastic. I'm doing better than uh, some people in the league are right now. Exactly. All right, let's hit the highlights of what went down in Jarro World. Snap back, four-man rush, deep ball down the right side for Gallup. Caught it! At the 15-yard line. And then out of bounds. The call from Brad Sham, the Sham God, and Babe Laufenberg of KRLD. Yes, Michael Gallup, Gallup had two incredible catches on the final Cowboys drive on passes thrown by Andy Dalton. And Greg the Leg closed the game out with a field goal. Cowboys 34-31 over the winless Giants. Uh, an important win for Dallas puts them in first place in the woeful NFC East. But that was not the big story after the game. Not even close. Hit it, Rick. And here's a quarterback draw up the middle. Prescott bouncing out to the left across the 20. He's inside the Sherwin-Williams red zone. 19 Boy, and he's hurt. Yard that line. Prescott's hurt. I didn't like the way he fell. When you run your quarterback, you're always taking a chance. He's holding his right leg. And yeah, that's going to get McCarthy off the sideline. Well, and they immediately, the official there in front of him immediately waved for medical personnel to come over and attend to Dak. Yes, it was a serious right ankle injury for Dak Prescott. In fact, it was a compound fracture of the right ankle. He has surgery scheduled uh, for Sunday night. It will end his season and in the eyes of many will end the Cowboys season Uh, shook. That was a really sad moment as the gravity of the situation revealed itself. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the replays when they were showing them immediately after it happened were, were gruesome enough, but you know, seeing Dak tearing up and, and wiping the tears from his face with a towel uh, as he's on the cart and getting driven away, you just realized all the ramifications of the injury that he had just sustained both with the Cowboys season and also with his future, with him playing on the tag, the risk associated with that all of a sudden becomes reality. Um, of course, it tanks a season that was already a struggle and in a game that was already a struggle. I mean, Dallas was down 17-3 to three at one point before they charged back. It looked like they were going to be able to, to kind of pull away before this happened and the air kind of got sucked out of the stadium at the same time that he got hurt. And, and you know, you worry as a fan of a team about the future of your team, but really, more importantly, you worry about the future of Dak Prescott, who has done more than enough to try to lift the Cowboys to victories early in the season uh, as their defense has not done its part, and he has thrown for an incredible mar- amount of yards. He's made plays with his legs, and he unfortunately gets hurt making a play with his legs. And, and it really just makes you wonder, you know, is this the last time we've seen Dak Prescott in Dallas? It, it mm. is a possibility. Well, I'm not sure if they're done this season in, in terms of that, that NFC East, but when you think about what Prescott's been through, man, I mean, you feel for him. Um He spoke so eloquently about, you know, struggling with mental health this year, like like a lot of people have. I mean, he lost his brother to suicide this year. He lost his mom, um, you know, as a lot of people know, before the draft. And uh, he seems like about as good a leader as there is in the NFL. Um, I... I don't know where the the Cowboys team goes like next. We could have that discussion in a second, but I I don't know. I I guess I have a hard time believing he's going to be anywhere else um, 
but Dallas in the future. I'm not saying this injury raises that or lowers it. I had a hard time really buying that that would happen before this, and, and I think that's still true. Just because because he's played too well, and it's just too crazy, um, too crazy to let a guy that 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 good go. I, I think you're right, and I mean, I, there aren't that on the juxtaposition on the same day that, and we'll get into it that we saw Alex Smith return um, to the field from his injury. That the, the day began with that, and it ended with this. Um, but the parallel also is that the outpouring of genuine care from enemy lines and beyond, and within the own locker room, um, that was pro Alex Smith. Dak has that too. I mean, I really, you know, players get injured every week, but the outpouring of people just saying how much Dak has meant to them and these stories that are bubbling up about things that we never knew about, things that he went out of his way to help people. Mike McCarthy saying that how, how much Dak Prescott has impacted him during their short time together. You know, and now Mike McCarthy, you couldn't script a, a, a sort of a, a more rough and tumble um, beginning to your career as a Cowboys coach than he has than what mm. he's been through over the first five weeks of the season. It's, it was a little surreal because Jason Garrett, now the offensive coordinator of the Giants, is one of the first people that gets to Garrett on the far sideline uh, when he gets to Dak on the far sideline when he's on the ground. You had Tony Romo in the booth for CBS, of course, who handed the baton uh, as Cowboys quarterback to Dak. And, yeah, it was a, like I said, compound fracture, which is the gnarly one. It's the one where the bone breaks through the skin. Uh, the good news is, as nasty as that injury is, um, it's we've seen it a lot where that's something that gets repaired and players return at, at full strength. And I'm I'm with you, Greg. I think barring some type of unforeseen complication in his rehab, I would imagine that Jerry Jones is going to still richly, richly reward Dak and he'll enter next season, hopefully week one as their starter and as one of the highest play, paid quarterbacks in the league. Mm -hmm. None of that would surprise me, but none of that helps him right now. That's speculation or the Cowboys, Andy Dalton. I thought that was an awesome signing by them. I mean, not that Andy Dalton's awesome, but I thought that was like when they signed Andy Dalton quietly this off season, uh, it struck me as one of the better moves for depth that we saw at the quarterback position. And you saw what he was able to do which is come into that game and um, put points on the board. Beautiful pass to Gallup to set up the game-winning kick. And the great Chris Wessling, who coined the Dalton scale, uh, where we try to figure out where quarterbacks exist and who is the prime meridian. And Andy Dalton famously is the prime meridian. Now, what sometimes the definition of that will get lost, and I'll I, even I lose it sometimes. But what Wes <laughs> always said was, He's the prime meridian because he his he rises and falls based entirely on what the team is around him. So if the Cincinnati Bengals had nobody on offense and the coaching stunk, he would stink. If if they if they were loaded, you would see what happened in 2015. This is the ultimate test of the Dalton scale because he now joins an offense with the three best you know wide receiver the best wide receiver triplets in the league and an all pro running back and a still solid offensive line. I'm excited to see Dalton's second act of his career, obviously mm. not the expense of Dak, but I'm excited to see how he does here. Yeah. And you know, he did find success today, nine of 11 for 111 yards. And of course that pass that set up that game winning field goal, which was a beauty and a great grab by, by Michael Gallup, but it, it will change their offense a little bit because it's just that you don't have the same guy running the system. I mean, and that is going to be an adjustment that they're going to have to make on the fly. But it still comes down to the same thing for them, which is their defense. You can't give up 34 points to the Giants. I don't care if one of those scores right. was a defensive touchdown. That's not going to win you games against almost anybody. And, and it almost cost them to that. Well, it's also like, what's the goal here? If the goal is to, to possibly go win this division, you know, that, that seems attainable. But for the Cowboys... You know they've done they've they've had first round losses like that'll be a good story and maybe it's something you can build on going into next year but they're not winning the title without Tyron Smith, Lyle Collins, and Dak Prescott. They're not going to the NFC Championship game without both of those tackles for the year and Dak Prescott. And this defense, by the way, I mean it's just not going to happen. So the, you no, know, the, but it's I would not. I would say that if you're if you're Mike McCarthy, if you're the coaching staff, like you've got to salvage something here. Sure. I mean, it's it's been a pretty disappointing head coaching job in general. I mean, I just, you know, I, part of it is Mike Nolan has his plan feels shotgun from decades ago and it doesn't function in 2020, according to, you know, the players seem, you know, peaked with it too. But, I mean, you can't, like, if you can't win this NFC East with the talent they have, 
Do they have talent on defense, though? Oh, well, they, I mean, it's one sided, but their offense is right. like their they collection do, of on offensive paper, talent. On paper, I mean, they, they're going to have, they're going to get Van Der Esch back. They have Jalen Smith. The secondary on paper doesn't look terrible. And they have Everson Griffin and Lawrence and Alden Smith. It sort of doesn't add up, but uh, they are two and three. That's good for first place. Hey, what they're about, what right about now. the Ewing theory? <laughs> All right, let's move I don't on. I think that applies here. How about not? Here's the snap to Poor Deshaun, day. throws up yeah, middle, we'll got a man, first half Cooks, left side 15, 10, 5, he's in, touchdown Houston on fourth down, 28 yards. Mark Vandermeer of KILT, no Bill O'Brien, no problem. I mean like no problems anymore, maybe. Deshaun Watson and Brandon Cooks found their rhythm and the Texans finally got off the schneid. 30-14 win over the Jaguars in the debut of interim coach Romeo Cornell. Shook, the Texans, uh, they look different to you today? Yeah, I mean, they played with a little more life, but I think they got a gift by playing the Jaguars. I mean, it, the Texans had an extremely difficult first three oh, games of the season. They earned that season. gift, though, Shook, when you look at their schedule. I mean, I mean, look, like they, they went from Kansas City to Baltimore to Pittsburgh to, to Minnesota, which, you know, you can say what you want about Minnesota, but it's Jacksonville, who has not played well since week two. Uh, that Thursday night game, that loss against Miami was essentially the start of their downfall. They haven't been able to pick up the pieces there, so it, it wasn't exactly the greatest challenge. It's still an NFL team, of course, but it wasn't like the competition that they've played before. So I think they did luck out a little bit there, but for the first time this season, I saw a Texans offense that actually moved the football with rhythm. Uh, uh, Deshaun Watson, despite his two interceptions, he was pretty sharp for the most part. For the first time this season, he established a connection with Brandon Cooks, who had eight catches for 161 yards and a touchdown. Um, they had they had pretty solid pace. Uh, David Johnson flirted with 100 yards rushing for the first time in two years. He didn't get there, so we can't say that it, you know he officially rushed for 100 yards after two years. But he, he finished with 96, and uh, they did a good job of putting the game away. But again, it was as much. And you give credit to their defense to an, to an extent, but it was as much to the Jaguars kind of making those mistakes and making it just, you know, greasing the skids a little bit for him to get their first win. But, hey, good on Romeo Cornell, who's proven in the past that he is a good interim head coach. Now, when he's a regular head coach, <laughs> it's a different story, but he's 1-0 as the interim head coach this year. The Jags are the slump busters of the NFL. And, yeah. and to be fair, they were the worst defense in the league before they lost their best player by far, Miles Jack, their second best player, uh, Josh Allen and their third best player, DJ Hayden, before this game even started. So they they were already uh, coming into this game as a tire fire. Uh, and Houston took care of business. At least their defense shook, I guess, played a little bit better. The Texans. I, I'm always like I'm surprised that when Minshew doesn't put up more points in this. Yeah, especially when he throws for 300 plus yards, right? Which he's done. And their record uh, in in games in which Minshew has thrown for 300 plus yards is not a, a, a good sign. So you don't want to rely too much on him. But they didn't get anything out of James Robinson today, who often met brick walls when he was running the ball. Leviska Chenault still contributed as he has for the majority of this year. But this is just a team that lacks weapons it lacks cohesiveness it does not look anything like the unit uh, on both sides of the ball the team that we saw in the first two weeks and it is it does have a lot to do with the losses like you said uh, of guys like miles jack i still find this to be this houston team to be somehow more depressing than the cowboys at this point and i'm going to need to go watch this tape closely um if i choose to do so to see if that uh, opinion holds true <laughs> well they were certainly more depressing i thought when Billy was there because a real ugliness had settled over there. I think they love Romeo. I think I saw after the game they were saying that all the meetings, like Romeo just says funny stuff all the time. They're well, always who, cracking How can up. you not love Romeo? He's I mean, like sort a, of like a lovable old he's Romeo like a walking grandfather. teddy bear. <laughs> but just watch out here, guys, because their schedule is going to soften up, and they now they can – Rally, it's like in Major League. We all shook, you, you know, your Cleveland yeah, Indians yeah, yeah, yeah. in Major League. Like sometimes it's good to rise up against the father figure or the owner or the general manager slash coach that you didn't like. What better way to stick it to Bill, Billy O'Brien out the door than to you know reel off five of six wins after his departure? You're back in. Hey, uh, Romeo, Romeo, it's, it ja happen. it's Jack Easterby with the Texans. You want to come coach the Tex Texans? Oh, hold on. I got a guy on the other line asking about white walls. <laughs> I mean, Romeo's been a player's coach. He, he, there's a, a famous clip in, in Brown circles, which there aren't many of those in the last 20-plus years. Maybe there will be some this year, but there aren't many, where he was in the locker room after a victory in 2007, his one great year with them, when he said, when you guys do well, it makes me look good, and I'm looking pretty good right now. And today the Texans looked Pretty good, I guess. So not bad for your first win. All right. Speaking of those Browns, Nick, hang around here. 
uh, as we dig into the latest Cleveland Conquest. Rivers on third down and four from his own 46-yard line. Motion by Taylor back into the backfield. Shotgun for Rivers. Third down. The Browns shoving off the left side. Then they drop off. Rivers back to pass. Late pressure coming. Steps up, throws. That's going to be picked off. They got it down the sideline. Picked off by Ronnie Harrison. It's a pick six. Touchdown. Ooh-wee. Jim Donovan with the call, WKRK. Philip Rivers' pick six was the one of was one of several killer mistakes by the veteran quarterback, uh, who has to have Frank Reich and the Colts brain trust thinking. After a 32-23 loss to the Browns, for Cleveland, it's four straight wins and the team's first four and one start since the goodish old days with Billy Belichick in the 1990s. Mark, what'd you take out of this one? I would note that the last time that happened, when they, in 1994, they, they, they made an interesting nugget at the end of the telecast that it was um, prior to the first season of Friends. Like, culturally, that's a really long time ago. I mean, beside all the little football, you know, items, this game is, to me, uh, another study in what this Browns team is this season. You know, you, it, the, the, the talk was, okay, this is a run-heavy team. They're systematically running for 200, 300 yards a game. And that's how, they've, that's how they've basically squeezed the life out of their opponents to get to 3-1. and one. What would happen in this affair against a really good Colts defense? They came out throwing the ball. I mean, it was, it was, it, 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 they couldn't run. They, they were unable to move the ball on the ground. But it really was the focus was putting it on Baker Mayfield's back early on. And he, I thought he had the best half that I've seen him play arguably – Ever. That's just, I'm talking about just like the defense you were playing. You weren't playing the Bengals. He had 228 yards over the first 30 minutes. Um, they were aggressively attacking Indy's secondary right up the middle of the field, and it was working. And, you know, this Browns team is learning to get up quickly as they did against Dallas, but then you've got to deal with the other 30 minutes. And they were lucky that Phillip Rivers um, is a quarterback right now who I think, number one, they're playing around the best they can, and that's not easy to do because they're not littered with stars, the Colts. But I don't th- think that they necessarily trust Phillip Rivers, and I also think that he just doesn't fit into what the Colts probably should be on offense. So there were like that, that was coming into view as this game was melting down the stretch for the Colts. But the Cleveland secondary allow, is inviting and allows sort of anyone back in. And I think one of the stories of the game for Cleveland, and Nick, I know you watched this too, but the, you know, they're days away from playing the Steelers, and they came out of here with Baker Mayfield, Wyatt Teller, their badass right guard, Ronnie Harrison, who had the pick six, who they brought in to play safety, Harrison Bryant, Jacob Phillips, Jordan Elliott, Sheldon Richardson, Olivier Vernon, and Kareem Hunt, all with injury questions heading into Monday. So, you know, it's, this, is, this team is not extremely healthy, but instead of a classic sort of Cleveland melt job, they made just enough plays down the stretch to get to four and one, and it's something that, I mean, Nick, I don't know where you were in 1994. I know where I was, and it feels like a long time ago. It was a zygote. In 1994, I was two. So. Um, Jacobs Field had opened, and my dad took me to the exhibition game the day before it opened, and we sat in the front row in the upper deck, which he still sits back in and wonders why he ever did that with a two-year-old son. That's insane. Um, but That's good for him. Yeah. I, I mean, good you think about it. Dad. Belichick was the head coach. Um, Nick Saban was the defensive coordinator. Ozzie Newsom was a front office executive who had yet to become the first black GM in the NFL in NFL history. Um, this is an extremely long time ago. Of course, it would be the year that we're in a pandemic that Browns fans can't enjoy this, but that's neither here nor there. You're right about how they've had this this identity of a run first team and how it just didn't work today. Kareem Hunt was under 80 yards rushing today. Dearness Johnson ripped off a run to kind of put things away at the end, but for the most part, they couldn't run the ball well. The Colts tackle really well individually. That's one thing that really jumped out to me. Open field tackles. They were not break. Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb are guys who do not go down on first contact usually. They usually break through an arm tackle. The Colts were very, very good at tackling, and it forced the Browns and Kevin Stefanski to just try to figure out a different way to move the football, and I do give him credit, especially in that first half. I thought these were two coaches who had pretty solid game plans, and it was just a matter of execution. In the first half, the Browns offense executed it very well, moved moved the Mm -hmm. ball down the 
the field pretty easily. I think they outgained um, the amount that the Colts allowed last week. I think they outgained them almost entirely through maybe two and a half, three quarters. So the offense was moving. They were getting past this defense. But they also ran into those troubles that you mentioned. And um, and it really came down to basically Phillip Rivers throwing a pick six and also getting uh, hit with a safety because of a grounding mm-hmm. penalty in the end zone. That was the difference in the game. Frank Reich said he thought Phillip Rivers is playing very good and is the least of my worries after 